My teacher was R.D. Lang, a Scottish psychiatrist, and uh, <clears throat> I'll start with a quote from him. He said, and I quote, psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to recover the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. Now this implies a symmetry. It implies a joint enterprise. It's the direct opposite, 180 degree opposite of any kind of objectifying approach. There is no us and there is no them. There are no psychopaths, there are no psychotics, there are no neurotics, there is just us folks. Now, politically speaking, I think it's a great idea to make this into a science. It's good because the power is with the scientists. However, among ourselves, I think we need to admit that what we are doing here in Aristotle's sense, it's the third science. The first one he called the theoretical sciences, like physics. The second kind of science he called <coughs> uh, productive sciences like medicine and architecture, he gave examples. Because there is a blueprint. There's a blueprint as to what we want. If, if, if I have my arm broken, I would want to go to a doctor because he knows how it should be and he will do his damnedest to bring about through techniques uh, <coughs> the ideal. However, uh, the third kind of science, there is no blueprint. When I was born, there was no tag attached to my toe as to what is a perfect Andrew Feldmar. There were no instructions, there is no blueprint. If I go to uh, somebody for help, um, I don't want them to do anything to me. The third kind of science, he said, was the <coughs> practical sciences, and the two examples that he gave were <coughs> politics and ethics. Ethics is how we treat each other. Politics is how to accrue and maintain enough personal power to do what you want and not what you don't want. Okay, so I think psychotherapy is definitely there with politics and ethics. You do it by the seat of your pants, it's always of the moment, you cannot generalize, there is no theory, there is no method. <coughs> Dancing, lovemaking, those are better metaphors than anything else I can think of. So, I, I would also say that personally, up until the age of 30, I think I made most of my decisions out of fear. Basically, every decision was an avoidance of pain and suffering. That's called uh, being in survival mode. It's only around 30, age 30, that I discovered that maybe one could live actually using as a compass one's desires, not one's fears. And then one starts living, not just surviving. So, um, <clears throat> my topic is how to train future psychedelic therapists, suppose MAPS, and Rick Dublin succeed in making MDMA and LSD and other uh, important uh, substances legal, who is going to use them? Who is going to be the future psychedelic therapist? Well, I would say the number one quality that that person would have to have is a certain kind of fearlessness. If anything slows down the birth process, and this is where I want to make a comparison between being a psychedelic therapist and being a midwife. Uh, Peter used the metaphor for a moment, fleetingly. I want to focus on it because I think the psychedelic therapist has to be um, <coughs> working under the feminine archetype. Uh, I think that uh, um <coughs> If you ask me, if, if I were a woman who was about to give birth, 
how would I select uh, the midwife I wanted to use? Well, I would want an older midwife. I would want a midwife who has seen everything. I wouldn't want an older midwife because of her expertise. I, would want a, I wouldn't want her because she could be there and not get frightened when something goes wrong because she's seen it a hundred times and she knows it's going to be okay. Fear is contagious. If the therapist is afraid under normal circumstances, um, although I think on some level it communicates drugs or no drugs, but if the person that you are with has ingested a psychedelic or an empathogenic, then if you are afraid, uh, the person is going to freak out. So you want somebody who is not going to be afraid, no matter what happens. And if he or she does get afraid, will immediately admit it and focus in on what's going on and why am I afraid. <clears throat> I would say that the DSM, even the new edition, or even more so, is like a bouquet. Um, you know, we all know about the flowers of evil. Uh, I would say the flowers of fear, uh, the DSM is a compendium of the flowers of fear. Every single diagnostic category that you can find is some variety of fear. If there is one thing that makes us suffer, it is fear. So <clears throat> I think that the, one of the most uh, significant experiences that one can have under a psychedelic, the death-rebirth process, where you actually die and you're not really glad, you really think that you've been poisoned uh, in spite of everything and even if you were hoping for it, in the actual moment, if it works, you think it's real and you cease to be. It's the Eleusinian mysteries. It's not a secret because when you start trickling back into your being, when there is uh, resurrection after the crucifixion. It's incredible, it's unbelievable. And it teaches you one thing, which is that you are living in spite of your efforts, not because of your efforts. It teaches you, <clears throat> it teaches you that life lives you. You don't have to live. Now, <clears throat> that experience basically is the only experience that can relax certain people who are stuck in survival mode. It's relaxing because th through every cell of your body you realize how useless it is to be in survival mode. Not cognitively, but you just realize. You step out of the way, let life lives you, you realize you're alive in spite of everything, all is well. Um, <clears throat> now the therapist clearly must know what this experience is like. The therapist must have gone through, the therapist must know the territory in which the patient is meandering. Because if the therapist doesn't, then inevitably he or she will get scared at certain points when the person is just going through what they need to go through. The most important question I think that a, thera a psychedelic therapist has to deal with and come to terms with is what to do when you don't know what to do, which is actually always. <laughs> I think any, any, any method, any, this is what you should do, appearing as an expert is basically uh, a soother in the mouth of the therapist. It's uh, any kind of school that we usually set up for psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and so on. It's really a theatrical school. It's how to teach one to act as if you knew. <laughs> but actually, if you are going to be with somebody who is in an altered state of consciousness, they'll know you know nothing. <laughs> so why pretend? However, um, <clears throat> I would imagine 
from my experience, the answer to what to do when you don't know what to do is do nothing. For God's sake, do nothing. Because anything you might do might be the wrong thing. So wait. And this is where I also think it's a feminine deal. Men don't know how to wait. Men don't know, in general, how to do nothing. Uh, men are heroes. They want to rescue the person. They want to do marvelous things. When, in fact, uh, the skill that one has to develop, if there is a skill, is to wait and wait until I am moved. There are certain situations that move one. Just like resurrection happens gratis, being moved happens gratis. So I am moved, the other I am with is moved. If we are moved to do something, we'll do it. If I'm not moved to do something, I wait until I am moved. Now, this kind of skill, I think, can only be transmitted through apprenticeship. Not schools, not books, um, <clears throat> but apprenticeship. Hanging out with somebody who already knows how to do this. Somebody who is already not afraid. Just like fear is catchy, it's infectious, not being afraid also transmits itself. I remember when I was about three and a half years old, um, I was born in Hungary, in Budapest. When I was three and a half, uh, <clears throat> the Germans and the Russians were bombing Hungary, hand-to-hand uh, -hand battles. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was alone, without my mother, without my father. Uh, I was surviving by the kindness of strangers. And I remember sitting on the strong arm of a man who I didn't know during the time that bombs were falling and there were explosions all around and the sky was red. And I didn't listen or looked or worried about anything except my eyes were riveted to his face. And if I saw that he wasn't afraid, I wasn't afraid. Lightning could be striking two feet from me. If he wasn't afraid, I wasn't afraid. The moment I saw fear in his face, I was flooded with terror. Now, I think this is how it goes. So, fearlessness can only be picked up even um, to conceive that you can stay centered when horrendous things are going on around you, I think can only be picked up in an apprenticeship. You have to hang out with somebody who does that. Otherwise, you, can't, you can read about it, but it's impossible. So, <clears throat> um, I would say, at first, the apprentice would have to receive therapy, psychedelic therapy, um, MDMA, LSD, whatever you've got, high doses. I'm all for high doses. Uh, you give low doses, it just uh, makes people strengthen their defenses. Come in with a high dose, you're home, free. Uh, I'm joking, <coughs> but I'm also telling you the truth. <coughs> so, first you would have to receive therapy. This is where, and, and again, therapy, this is not scientific, this is not uh, technical. You get a lot of attention from somebody who's been there. So therapy, actually the Greek word means attend, pay attention. So at first, you would receive a lot of attention. <clears throat> so your responsibility for the situation is zero. Just like when you're a child. When we start, our responsibility is zero. Somewhere in between, uh, <clears throat> it would be very good, it was good for me, when the elder says, let's do acid together. Now, when Lang said that to me for the first time, uh, I said, sure. 
And then next day I phoned him. Uh, oh, he said that no money needs to exchange hands. Next day I realized what that means. That means that we have 50-50 responsibility. I said, I'm not ready, I'll pay, which meant I can have zero responsibility. <laughs> right? He holds me, I am being attended to, I am being held, and I don't have to worry about him. Now that's worth a considerable amount of money. It was several months later, uh, advancing in my psychotherapy and apprenticeship with him, where he said, well, how about another acid trip? And I said, sure. And this time, no money needs to cha uh, uh, change hands. I was ready. So I think uh, uh, an apprentice would have to go through these steps. You receive therapy, zero responsibility, then be together, and of course, the therapist takes uh, the substance as well as you. None of this, you take it, I don't. So, you know, Lang, in cases where he felt responsible for the other in some way, he would take half the dose that he gave the other. So if he gave me 1,200 micrograms, then he took 600. Right? <laughs> Eventually graduating to <coughs> both therapist and uh, trainee or apprentice taking the same amount and hanging out together with no decision as to who looks after whom. So you go from 0% responsibility to 100% responsibility for yourself. And later, under supervision, he said, OK, now you can have your first psychedelic uh, therapy patient. So uh, I said, OK. I gave uh, 600 micrograms to the patient. I took 300. And that was the first time that I was in an altered state of consciousness being responsible for somebody who was in an altered state of consciousness. But again, we were there together. Not, I'm the doctor and you are the patient. Uh, surprises occur. And that's one of the skills that I think a psychedelic therapist has to um, uh, contend with. And to me, I've been working now for 43 years, and I think I'm not burnt out, have never been burnt out, because I love surprises. And in this profession, the learning curve never flattens. <laughs> like you continually learn and still know nothing. In this very first, in this very first session, a young man, um, <clears throat> was very sweet, and uh, at a certain point he looked at me deeply in my eyes and said, I would like to have your penis up my ass. Now, I was high. I thought, hey, what an idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was well enough trained by then to say, <clears throat> interesting thought. Uh, let me think about it. <laughs> you know, you don't want to shame, humiliate, or uh, give a bad experience to the other. So I appreciated his candor and his uh, unabashed appreciation of me. <laughs> Next day, I went for supervision to Lang, and I told him that. He gave me a totally surprising... Uh, um, possibility of what may have been happening. He suspected that being with me under those conditions was extremely exciting for this young man. He was excited. He was elated. And he says, when you really get excited, there is pilo erection. The, your, the hair stands on end and shivers run up your spine. When you really like something, when you're really excited about someone, hair stands up on your neck, shivers run up your spine. He says, Lang says, probably this guy never had this kind of interpersonal experience except sexually. 
Plus, the pleasure was running up from his bottom to his top, so he thought he wanted my penis up his ass. But Elang said, good thing you didn't do anything about it, because it would have been a mistake. Now, Lang called himself, and I still call myself, really not a therapist, not a um, healer, uh, but a, a social phenomenologist, which really means that I'm not interested in explanations, I'm interested in trying to find the correct words to describe and depict what is the case. Actually, my experience is if, a, if, if somebody I work with and I succeed in this enterprise of actually between us finding the right words for what's going on, everything changes, everything shifts. This kind of inquiry in itself is healing. You don't have to do anything else. Apart from the fact that social means that the trouble is always between us, not within me or within the other. So mental illness Still, we talk as if there was such a thing, but it's such a horrible metaphor. Either you have a brain disease, in which case you should see a neurologist or a brain surgeon, or we have problems in living. There's nothing else. So, I think no one suffers unless that person is being badly treated or has been badly treated. No one hurts who hasn't been hurt. And that kind of hurt is always interpersonal. I think we can survive without great trauma, an earthquake. If the people around us treat us well during it, the major trauma is betrayal trauma, where one human being betrays another. That's why I think um, <clears throat> PTSD is not an illness. It's an existential reality of what happens to a human being when the human being feels betrayed in despair where the person realizes there is no justice in the world, there is no, I can't trust anybody beca because behind everyone's face, there could be the face of a betrayer or somebody who is going to hurt me. So I might as well get out. What, what hope, what hope do I have for a relationship under these conditions? Why would I want to play at living? So if the trauma is interpersonal, then the healing has to be interpersonal. Now, the, the, the psychiatrist who best described uh, what happens with PTSD, in my opinion, is Judith Lewis Herman, a Harvard-trained uh, psychiatrist, who, who, who simplified matters very much like I do. That doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. The person has been hurt. And there are three phases of therapy that one goes through. The first one is establishing some measure of safety, security, and trust. The second one, remembering and grieving. And the third one is reconnecting, because people who have been hurt cannot connect. They can pretend they connect. They can have fake connections, but the connection is not heartfelt, it's not real. Um, the first phase, the establishing some measure of safety, security, and trust um, can take an hour or it can take five years or more. It takes as long as it takes. And fortunately, she has said that. She, it's in print. It takes as long as it takes. Relationship cannot be established by fiat. Let the, we, are, we have a relationship. Right. Um, so relationship grows. It's an organic thing. It takes sometimes a very long time for it to, uh, uh, to be real, for trust, safety, and security to exist. Now, as soon as that exists, the traumatized person will remember and grieve. As soon as the person feels safe, you don't have to have tricks, you don't have to have methods. It happens automatically. That's what the human spirit does. 
If I don't have to be in survival mode, then I will remember and grieve, because grieving is the natural human response to irretrievable, irreconcilable loss. You know, you've been screwed, you've been ripped off, face it. You can only say that when there is a container of safety, security, and trust. So the other two phases we don't have to worry about. Now I think MDMA, for example, since it's an empathogen, it opens one's heart, it presents one. For the first time, some people feel no shame. Victims usually feel more shame than the perpetrators. So here is a substance that suddenly, for the first time in your life, makes you experience what it's like to be with another human being and not feel ashamed opens your heart and you see, you have empathy for the, for the other person, the therapist. And if the therapist is genuinely harmless, genuinely harmless, if the therapist really deeply knows that I am not going to do anything to you, no matter what, then that communicates in that state to the other. And for someone for whom it may take three to five years to trust the therapist, actually, feel safe and trust the therapist within an hour. And that's unforgettable. Uh, MDMA is not like LSD where there is state-specific memory. A lot of things I learned uh, in the LSD state, I forgot when I came into ordinary state of consciousness, only remembered when I went back to it. That's like a drunk. Sometimes we'll only remember what happened last night when he gets drunk again. It's not so with MDMA. Whatever you really learn and realize, it's permanent. It stays with you. Now, that doesn't mean that later on you don't have to work on freeing yourself of habits that you have uh, uh, shackled yourself with in order to survive. So it's not the end of the line, but uh, the therapeutic alliance deepens and the container in which the person can uh, flourish um, uh, is real. So, I think that all these things have to occur to the future psychedelic therapist. Uh, can't just say, well, I know this exists, I know this is how it should go, but I myself never experienced it. Like, that wouldn't be convincing. Um, what would be counterindication either for uh, a, a selecting a therapist or a patient? Uh, I, I just want to uh, give you one example, which is uh, uh, if I suspect that somebody is in such a mess in their life that um, there is such responsibility on their shoulders, they are so stressed that they might take the occasion as an option to never resume their life as their life was before. That is to basically commit suicide through LSD or MDMA. Basically uh, deciding that there is the chance to decide, I, won't, I don't want to come back. Uh, uh, I'm going to go crazy. If I have a sense, an intuition, that somebody might use the occasion for this kind of uh, uh, escape from their lives, then I postpone doing uh, uh, psychedelics with them until their life changes, until, uh, until there is some indication that they want to go back into their life. Um, I'll close by saying uh, the very first time I met R.D. Lang was in Vancouver. Uh, he was talking to professionals and he asked the question of, are you a healer uh, because uh, uh, you are or is it an ego trip for you? Uh, is it, uh, you know, be being a therapist, uh, being a healer uh, gives you a certain kind of power. Is it, are you here because of an ego trip. At that time, that was in 1974, I didn't know. So that's why I went over to England and worked with him to figure it out. I asked him how to become a healer. 
He said, either you're born one or you have to apprentice with one. Well, I chose to apprentice. Thank you.